<laughs> and these two, three guys are standing out there, and, and one of them says, um, are you rapping, Bob? And I was kind of, the way he said it was kind of harsh. Let me tell you something. He said, I don't even like the NAACP that much. I don't understand it that much. He said, but I saw you up there fighting for unemployment. My, my brother needs unemployment. And he started telling his story. He said, listen, we got to talk. We got to get together. Somebody been keeping us divided. I mean, I, that's what I heard him saying. He didn't say those exact words. And if we don't learn how to figure this out, they're going to divide us and then take the, yes. take the farm, the, the, the cows, the horses, and everything else. Well, thank you for coming to the mountain. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. We're looking for more chairs. Always a good sign, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's been digging for chairs. So, around here, and then first hallway to the right. Okay, first hallway to the right. Yeah. Oh, there's one. I just wanted to ask if it was all right. I promise. I'm going to use this restroom. Where is it? Right in here. They've said Moral Monday would be nothing. They said we were just uh, foolish. They said you couldn't bring black and white people together. The governor said we were all outside agitators. He used, if you go back, he used this identical line that George Wallace used in June of 1963. The same line. I, 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 Tim and I looked it up. I mean, it's almost the exact same line, outside agitators. You know, rather than debate us on the issues, he engaged in historical plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I understand that, that it is something to be told for the president of the NAACP to be here in Mitchell County, in Spruce Pine, on a, su on a Sunday afternoon. Pentecostal, serving a congregational church in an Episcopal church, yes. believing, believing that we can still build a beloved community and be one people. This moment is special. Amen. Amen. My parents, both of them worked in education. And the rural started out in Indianapolis, Indiana, and came back home in the late um, mid-1960s, I was born two days after the March on Washington. And my mother went into labor on the 28th and she stopped. And the story is that I decided to wait and see if people were real serious about getting together. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be 50 this year, on the 30th. My mother and father came back from Indianapolis to work with whites and blacks in rural eastern North Carolina who understood that public education was the key to rescuing those children down in the rural, rural eastern North Carolina and giving them hope and opportunity. My mother still works today at 80 years old in the school that she integrated. And I tell you this story, when she first went there, she was hated. And now that all the children, regardless of color, call her mom, call her mom. And she goes to work every morning at 7 o'clock. I grew up in a farm community worked on the farm. I primed tobacco and chopped peanuts and fed hogs, because that's what we had to do. I grew up in a community where preachers, teachers, and farmers were revered. Those who declared the gospel, those who elevated the mind, and those who grew our food. I was taught to work hard, to study hard. But I was also taught to help my neighbor. Yes. And I was taught that when people fall on hard times, the community is supposed to come together. And the government should come in there because everything can't be done through private charity. And yet I was taught by my grandma. I often tell this story that my grandmother, I went to seminary and I thought I learned a little something. But what I really learned about one of the basic theological principles, and that is the principle of hope, I learned it from my grandmother. When I was young, my grandmother used to get up on Saturday mornings. She had this apron that had three pockets in it. 
She'd get up on Saturday morning, she would go out with a group of people, and in one pocket she would put dust rags. In the other pocket she would put some anointing oil. In the other pocket she would put a little piece of money and clip it with a safety pin so it wouldn't come out. And one day I asked her, I said, Grandmama, where are you going? And she said, I'm going to hope somebody. Now, where I come from, you don't talk back to old people. <laughs> and I said to myself, I was about sixth, seventh grade, I said, Grandmama didn't mean hope, she meant help, but she's not that educated. And so that's why she said, I'm going to hope somebody. And later on, I learned, though, that my grandmother would go to people's houses and if they needed their house clean, she would take out those rags and clean. Because she believed that you ought to help your neighbor when they fall on hard times. If they were sick, she'd go in and put that anointing oil on them and pray for them. If they didn't have any money because they had been unemployed or because the meal had closed, she'd put a little piece of money in their hand. It took me going all the way to seminary. I was in a class one day on systematic theology and it was talking about this guy named Jurgen Moltmann and he said that hope is produced when people engage in acts of liberation and justice that remind people that they're still human. Yeah. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and I said, you know what, Grandma was right. She was grammatically wrong, but she was theologically right. Because when she, when she put a piece of money in the hand of somebody who had fell on hard time, she was hoping them. She was giving them hope. When she anointed that person who was sick and couldn't get out to church and reminded them they still matter, she was hoping them. She was giving them hope. When she cleaned that house and she got her hands dirty with their dirt and their soil so that they could lay in a clean bed, she was hoping them. She was giving them hope. And so every now and then I sing that song, if I can help somebody, I change it in honor of my grandma. And I say, if I can hope somebody <laughs> as I pass along, then my living will not be in vain. And, and that story has carried me throughout life that, that, that we, what are we doing with the positions and the power and the privileges we have to hope somebody, to help somebody, to give folk hope. There are 500 years of ministry in my family. I want to announce tonight, as I do a lot of places, that I am a conservative Christian. Well, And I want to define that. <laughs> because I think sometimes the definition is off what I see sometimes on the TV. I'm conservative if the definition of conservative means to hold on to, to preserve the essential nature of, then I'm a conservative. And some of the people sometimes that I see call themselves conservatives are liberals. Because if conservatism means holding on to the essential nature, my Bible tells me that love is at the center of what it means to be a Christian. Huh? My Bible tells me that doing unto others as you would have them do unto you is essential to what it means to be a Christian. My Bible says helping the little ones and not despising the fatherless is the center. Justice is the center. Isaiah 10 says, woe unto those who make unjust laws. In fact, in, in the Message Bible, it says, woe unto those who legislate evil that rob people of their rights. That's what the Bible says. Isaiah 58 says, if you want to be a repairer of the breach, you have to care for the hurting and the poor and loose the bands of wickedness. And in Hebrew, the, word, the phrase loose the bands of wickedness actually means pay people what they deserve for a day's work. <laughs> and that's the fast that God desires. And if we do those kinds of things in society, then in fact we become repairs of the breach. Jesus' first sermon, Luke 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he said, he hath anointed me, and he listed five categories of people. He said, preach good news to the poor, recover sight to the blind, healing to the brokenhearted, release to the captive, healing to the bruised, and to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Micah 6, 8. I want to conserve that. That's an essential. It's not a suggestion. What doth the Lord require? Not suggest. 
not just for individuals, but for governments, for society. What does the Lord require? Not suggest, but to do justice. Love mercy and walk humbly before your God. John, a new commandment I give unto you. Not a suggestion. This is, this is, the, conser this is the conservative part of our faith. A new commandment I give unto you. That you love one another. And by this love, all men will know, not have to guess, not have to worry, that you are my disciple. Huh? And then Matthew 23, where it says, Woe unto those who clean the outside of cup, but the inside is full of death. And then it says, Do you know what the weightier matters of the law? The real, what really matters? Love, justice, and mercy. And then that question that Jesus says is going to be the ultimate question for me, the ultimate question for every legislature, mm -hmm. the ultimate question for, uh, for, for governments, for people, those questions that are going to be asked that ought to be the grid that we lay down on everything we do before we decide to implement it. When I was hungry, did you feed me? <coughs> when I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was thirsty, did you give me a drink? When I was sick, did you come see me? When I was in prison, did you visit me? Because in as much as you do unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. I believe that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> everything in me. If I didn't, I would hang up my preaching role. I, I'm a full-fledged Christian conservative. I want to conserve what the Lord said about our role. And that's why it concerns me sometimes when I see people wanting to dismiss those things and lift up other things. As somebody said, major in the minors and minor in the major. I, I love my faith. But I understand that this faith is not just about how much you can take for yourself, how much you can ask God to be your divine bellhop to give you what you want. <laughs> but ultimately, this faith, all of us going to be judged under whom much is given, much is required. We're going to be judged by how in this life did we use our positions, our power, our privileges to lift up other people and make it better for those around us. I'm also a constitutionalist. I don't think we wrote a constitution just for fun. I believe we the people. I don't believe we that happen to be close to Art Pope should run everything. I don't believe that. I can't find that anymore. I believe what Lincoln said at Gethsemane, a Republican, the Lincoln Republican, who said that the government of the people and by the for the people, we must ensure that that government never fades from this earth. I believe what our Constitution said 145 years ago, I believe, tell me, 1868, when blacks and whites came together after slavery, black and white people, they said, okay, let's try to start afresh. Let's try to go forward. We had some ugly history. Had some bad days, had, had some evil stuff, but let's try to go forward. And they wrote, we hold it to be self-evident that all persons are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, the enjoyment of the fruit of your own labor, and the pursuit of happiness. That's in our state constitution, and it was put there by whites and blacks who were deciding we've got to go forward past this this history of slavery and division. That language is not even in the United States Constitution. You own, that language is actually the Declaration of Independence. But our foreparents, black and white, said let's put it in our Constitution. Then they wrote, all political power is vested in and derived not from money, but from the people. All government of right originates from the people and is founded upon their will only and is instituted solely for the good of the whole. Say good of the whole. Good of the whole. Our Constitution, 145 years ago, they laid down a principle that when you're in government and you're elected, you are not supposed to govern for the whims of a few. 
You are supposed to govern for the good of the whole. In other words, you're not supposed to pass a piece of legislation and all you worry about is how it's going to affect the triangle or how it's going to affect Charlotte or how it's going to affect the triad. You've got to look at how will it affect far eastern North Carolina and far western North Carolina. Yeah. The good of the whole. Yeah. I believe this stuff. I believe that we should, we should hold on to it. I believe we should conserve it. They said, they said 145 years ago, all elections shall be free. Not might be free, not must be free, not could be free, but shall be free. Which means any attempt to buy elections is a violation of our most fundamental constitutional rights. They said all political rights and privileges are not dependent upon or modified by property, no property qualification shall affect the right to vote or to hold office. They wrote that in the Constitution to ensure that would, there would never be a powerful financial olig oligarchy that would control our government. Yes, sir. Section 12, they said the people have a right to assemble together, to consult for their common good and to instruct their representative. We should have never been arrested. The Constitution of this state says legislators don't instruct us. They don't come back to Spruce Pine and tell you what they're going to do. They don't get elected and then do something other than what you asked them to do when you sent them up there. The Constitution says we are supposed to instruct them and then apply to the General Assembly for redress of our grievances and it says secret political societies, like Alec, <laughs> that's what is here. It says secret political societies, listen, are dangerous to the liberties of a free people and shall not be tolerated. If a legislature cannot produce the legislation that they were sent to by the people and the best they can do is go get a secret society to write for them a piece of legislation, our Constitution says don't tolerate that. Don't tolerate that. Send them back home. Unelected. Do not tolerate someone being turned and twisted by secret hands that pass legislation that mess up our lives. I believe this. I, I believe in section 15 where it says the people have a right to the privilege of education. The people, not just students, not just young folk. 145 years ago they said the people have a right because there were a lot of illiterate adults, a lot of African Americans who were slaves. And then, so they said the people, and, and guess what? Two people made sure that was in there. A black preacher named J.W. Hood, who was an AME Zion preacher, and a white minister named Samuel Ashley. They were the two that came together, white and black, and made education in North Carolina a constitutional right mm -hmm. and put it in Article 1, not Article 2, not Article 3, not Article 4, not Article 5. We don't even get to voting until Article 6. <laughs> <laughs> but education. Yes, is in Article 1. The qualification for voting is Article 6. But education is in Article 1. So when people heard public education, they are going back to what's past a principle that's been in place 145 years. I'm a constitutionalist, and I believe we all ought to be constitutional. I'm a conservative, but, but by definition, not some of what some folks say. I'm a conservative in the sense that I believe I don't know how to be Christian without loving Paul. I don't know how to be Christian without being concerned about justice. I don't even know how to be a constitutionalist without being concerned about justice because even our federal constitution, the first principle of government is to establish justice. Then the common good, promoting the general welfare and domestic tranquility. And then you get to the freedom. Because what, free, what is freedom? It's not just free to do anything. As I was taught, it's freedom to be able to participate in the making of a better society. So when I look at what's happening now in public policy, I believe we need to have a conversation, y'all, that's not black, not white, not Democrat, not Republican, not liberal, not conservative. There are times you have to deal with that, and I'm not one that's going to back up. Sometimes you got to do what we call um, you got to disaggregate the numbers. Sometimes you got to look at how policy hurts women. 
You got to look at how it hurts African Americans. You got to look at how it hurts people in certain geographical areas. But in terms of how we talk, we have got to understand our interconnectedness. And we've got to have a conversation that doesn't trap us into these little puny categories like black and white and liberal and conservative and Democrat and Republican. We're at a place in history we need a conversation about just this, what's right and what's wrong. Amen. Some things are just wrong. <laughs> Did you, did you come up in a house where some things were just wrong and some things were just right? I believe that people ought to work. Hmm? I had to. I primed tobacco and chopped cotton, corn, and made money to get my clothes for school and a number of other things I could talk about. But when North Carolina has the fifth highest unemployment in the country, when the economy in a place like Mitchell County has struggled since the decline of the railroad, just like down east, the railroad went, a whole lot of things went, went, and you come down to eastern North Carolina and see what I'm talking about. When places like, when the reality is that textile and furniture have gone, and you all didn't send them anywhere. In fact, your tax dollars helped build up a lot of those growth corporations, and then once they got so they could, they took them somewhere else. Amen. Hmm? Yeah, your, your, your tax dollars helped get them up. They got all kinds of tax incentives to come here. But, in, with, but there, was no, there, there were no uh, uh, um, policy restraints to say if you get this tax dollars, you can never leave. So they're gone, just like down east. And the reality is when you look at places like Bakersville and Spruce, Spruce Pine, our state's poorest county, and I don't mean the people are poor because I believe all of us are, 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 are made by God, but what I'm talking about in terms of income and investment, in this state, when, you, when I, I, I studied public policy, when you draw the circle around the counties with the least amount of investment and the least amount of intent, uh, uh, attention, you draw the circle around far eastern North Carolina and far western North Carolina. And a lot of times we get ignored. If you're east of 95 or if you're west of Statesville. <laughs> huh? 77. Okay, let's talk about that, right? And so you get ignored. And that's just real. In, in counties like up here, 13 to 15% unemployment. And the range is third to sixth highest in the state of North Carolina. Child poverty, 25%. Eight of the 18, 18 westernmost counties in North Carolina have double digit unemployment. It's not a black issue, a white issue, it's a people's issue. And in some places, like Graham County, the unemployment is 18.5%. Swain County is 16.5%. And the medium income in Mitchell County is about 30000 per household. So that means that you have people in these, these communities who want to work. You're not talking about folks that don't want to work, but have gotten caught in the recession, have gotten caught in the non-attention that public policy Democrats and Republicans have often engaged in. And so we have communities in North Carolina where people are experiencing hard times, and the hard times didn't just start yesterday. And yet they keep their heads up. Yes. Yet they keep believing. Yet they keep trying to educate their children. They keep trying to make it. And when that is happening, there's something wrong. When people have lost jobs at no fault of their own and have fallen on hard times, it's immoral and it's extreme and it's a violation of our deepest biblical principles and our constitutional values for people in our General Assembly to pass policies that hurt unemployed workers who are just trying to make it and feed their families.
There's something wrong, and I've asked this question, what kind of Christian will take people's unemployment because the government, when it had the chance, did not tell corporations to pay the right amount of money. So during the recession, because there wasn't enough money in the bank, in the unemployment fund, the fund went down. And now that the fund is down, not because of the people's fault, but because of policy fault, you want to pay the fund back on the backs of the people who didn't create the lack of money in the first place because you, you, you claim that if you tell the corporations to pay their fair amount, that that somehow is going to drive them away. There's something wrong, something extreme and immoral when the governor gives his new appointees a pay increase and wealthiest among us a tax cut, and then sarcastically suggest that if people are paid unemployment at the rate the federal government says, it's going to make them lazy and they won't go to work. They would, that's what they said. That I heard it when they were in the, in, the, in the committees. They said, people, if we don't cut this unemployment, people will stay home and they won't work. So the young man that I met who has cancer and was at Marl Monday, few weeks ago and his job left and he's a white man and he has cancer he says I don't know what I'm going to do now because on June the 30th he was one of the 70,000 North Carolinians not black, not white, not Latino just North Carolinians who lost their unemployment simply because the, 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 the legislature and the government would not adjust the date they didn't even have to come up with any money. All they had to do was just adjust the date. And they were so callous that they raised the money that they're giving to their appointees and cut unemployment. Hard working people who lost their jobs of no fault of their own and are trying to make it and feed their family. 70,000 is the number of long term workers that lost their unemployment on June the 30th. 100,000 is the number that will additionally lose, which means by the end of the year, 170,000 hardworking North Carolinians, for no reason, will have their unemployment snatched away from them because they're trying to claim that they're paying a debt that the unemployed people didn't create, but they're going to pay the debt back on the backs of the unemployed. That will take $1.2 billion out of our economy which is going to cause other job loss. It's going to cause folk to have less money. Now, maybe that's what our Pope wants since in, on his website, he actually brags about the fact that he only puts his stores in poor communities. So this policy will actually create more people with less wealth who will then have to go shop at his store and buy these cheap goods. Y'all, that's something wrong with that. Now, Ronald Reagan said, that EITC, Earned Income Tax Credit, was good because it was not a giveaway because it, it only helped working people. In other words, if you're working but your wages were low, then you could get an earned income tax credit. In this state, 907,000 people received earned income tax credit. Republicans, Democrats, blacks, white, people from the west, people from the east, people in the middle. This legislature cut, ended earned income tax. We only had it six years. They ended it. They ended a program that Ronald Reagan said was good so they could give 23 of the wealthiest families an estate tax cut. 23. That ain't right. Now, now watch this. 64,000 of those 900,000 that lost their earned income tax are military families. People who have gone off and fought for our freedom, fought in war, who come back here, and the jobs they have are low-income jobs, but they're working. And they, and they receive that earned income tax credit to help them make it. And now 64,000 of our military families have lost their earned income tax credit. Hmm? 64,000. And then on top of that, when they pass this budget, 
they're going to increase sales taxes in areas that we've never paid for, like hairdos and haircuts and, you know, the, 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 so callous that they're cutting out the free tax weekend so you can go buy your children some notebooks for school. That's gone. This is the last weekend. Let's go out cut that. And when you raise sales taxes, my friend, you violate, you know, this is the crowd that said they wanted to cut taxes for people, and people bought that line, I'm going to get my taxes cut. But now this budget and what they've done, the economists say 80 to 85 percent of North Carolinians will see their taxes increased. But $10,000 is the amount of tax cut that millionaires will receive. So 80% of North Carolina is going to see their taxes go up. Millionaires are going to see their taxes go down. That's extreme. That's immoral. That's bad public policy. It's constitutionally inconsistent. It's morally indefensible. And it's economically insane. conversation we need to have that's bigger than these little puny, you know, categories of liberal versus conservative, Republican versus Democrat. It's about what's right and what's wrong. Yes. And then we all know the value of education, the value of teachers and schools. All through the Bible, we are commanded to teach. Go back as far as the Hebrew scriptures. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God, and it tells you then to teach our children. High, the, te the teachers in ancient Israel and in our community have been lifted up, the backbone of our community. This is dear to my heart. I had to watch my mother cry in recent days. She's almost 80. As she says to me, son, I, I came back home to fight for public education, and I never thought I would have a son 50 years old fighting to hold on what, to, to what we fought for. Yeah. Yeah. She said, you would have never convinced me of that 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. Investment in education is an investment in our future. <clears throat> it's extreme, it's immoral, it's bad public policy. I don't care what your party is to defund and deconstruct public education. President Eisenhower said, that public education was a matter of national security. Mm -hmm. yes. What did he say? And no governor in this state, Republican or Democrat, has ever gone backwards on public education. Mm -hmm. Jim Martin pushed funding. Huh? You can read the records. So sometimes this crowd, I don't even call Republican and Democrat. You have a crowd that's extreme and, and have come up with some wild ideas about public policy, and then you have rest of North Carolina that's got to decide, are we going to come together and do better than this? Mm -hmm. yes, sir. 145 years ago, this state said public education was a right, a constitutional right. So when a legislature hurts public education, they are unraveling 145 years. Let me, let me own something for you. And I'm just being transparent. Charles B. A. Cox is not one of my heroes. He was the governor of the state. He helped lead to what eventually became the Wilmington riots, where people were killed in Wilmington because blacks and whites were working together, and there was a crowd that wanted to stop that. And back then, the crowd that wanted to stop the forward movement attacked at least three things, voting, public education, and progressive tax policy. He's not a hero of mine. But even in all of his crazes, even in all of the ways he twisted race and used it, he, he still focused on education. Now, I don't agree with the stuff Timmy did historically. You know, but even when he went out and argued for, for funding, for tax dollars to go toward education, he went to certain communities, white communities, and said, look, you don't want your children not to be educated. So it's a strange bird that gets in office and decides that they want their legacy to be the defunding and deconstruction of public education. Something wrong with that. That's right. Because see, Alec, at the end of the day, the reason they want the privatized education is because they can't 
the, a lot of people who are wealth, who are uh, uh, greedy, <laughs> as you said, know they can't make as much money out in the other market now, so they want to come in and begin to cipher off money from the government for their own personal pockets. Some of them don't hate government. They just hate government money going to anybody but them. You, you can't hate government if you just pass a, 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 a budget that's going to send $10 million, $10 million of my tax dollars to private schools. That's government money. And so what we have here now in this budget, listen to what they did. They knocked 30,000 preschool children, poor preschool children, at-risk children, access to preschool. 5,200 teaching positions will be lost as a result of this budget. 5,000. And I don't, maybe I'm, in, let me see if I'm in the right place. In my hometown of Plymouth, North Carolina, Janesville, North Carolina, you know, teaching jobs are the backbone of our economy, not, not, not just of our future. Yeah. But they're going to cut 5,000. 4,580 teacher assistants are being cut. This government has already signed that budget. Zero is the number of dollars for salary increases for teachers. Since they took office in 2010, they have cut nearly $2 billion from public education, including nearly a billion dollars for our public universities. 15 years right now is the number of years it currently takes for a North Carolina public school teacher with a bachelor's degree to earn $40,000. And this budget now makes North Carolina 50th in the nation. Now, the governor said the other day, and I'm almost through, he said, we are spending more money in education now than ever before. <laughs> That's what he said with a straight face. Well, no, not really. <laughs> he, said, he said, we are spending more money. Now, that's true if you just look at it in terms of actual dollars without looking at it in terms of adjustments for inflation, which is the way anybody that really wants to be honest will do something. You, you do that all the time because you know, you know the dollar is not what it used to be. Am I right? I mean, if your, your children don't, I used to ask 50 cent. I thought 50 cent was a, was real. My children, they don't have no shame. Daddy, we need $20. Because <laughs> <laughs> inflation. So the economists, the economists say that we, this budget puts a total, listen to this, 7 billion, 867, 960,649 dollars in the 2014 fiscal year budget. But that is $535 million less than the 2008 inflation adjusted budget. So it's more money in actual dollars, but it's less money when you look at what those dollars will buy. The governor's own office of state budget, his own office, not mine, not the NAACP's, not the Republicans, not the Democrats, the, his own independent, the office of state budget and management, estimated that in order to keep public education at its current funding levels, it would have required this legislature to spend $7,984,924,757, which is $17 million less than what they budgeted. So the governor's own budget office says that this budget takes us backwards rather than forward. Governor McCrory also claimed at this same news conference when he signed the tax reform package that teachers making between $40,000 and $45,000 annual will get 1% of their earnings back. That's what he said. But when the economists looked at the tables in the tax reform, the economists say that citizens don't get a 1% tax break until they have a household income of $250,000. My doctorate was in pastoral care and public policy. 
So, so it's preaching and it's, 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 it's taking scriptural principles and then applying them to the public arena. Governor McCory said in this same news conference, North Carolina ranked in the 40s in 2010, just like we do now in terms of teacher salary. He said in the 40s. When actually in 2005, we ranked 27th, we dropped to 46 in 10 years, and that's why, and I challenge Democrats on this too, because we've been out here pushing them as well. But now we're at 50. We're at 50. And this is devastating to who we are as a people and our constitutional call and our moral call to educate our children. This is immoral, it's extreme, it's bad public policy, it's constitutionally inconsistent, it's morally indefensible, and it's economically insane. And we from Mitchell County, whether you're in Mitchell County out here in the West or Martin County in the East, we have got to come together and save the soul of this state. public policy, now they're trying to rig the elections. Now, I just have to own this because they say all of this is about voter integrity and voter ID. Wherever you stand on that, we can debate that. But let me tell you something. If you don't trust them with education, you better not trust them with voting either. <laughs> See, some stuff is a smokescreen. And you have to understand there have been some deliberate things. I don't have time to do it, maybe, but there have been some deliberate things since the 60s, particularly in the South, to keep this room from happening, to keep us from coming together. They made all this to do about fraud, whatever you feel about that. They made all this to do about voter ID. But what you may not know is that this bill that they have passed goes way past voter ID. Now, first of all, there are 318,000 North Carolinians registered now who do not have a North Carolina driver's license or state identity card. I've met white and black elderly people. There are 300,000. I didn't say black people. I didn't say white people. See, they tried to make it like it was a minority issue. But there are 318,000. There's some in this county. You, you all have any people here that's old enough that they were born by midwives? They were, they, you got in this county, right? So if they came out midway, they may not have certain things today. And 67% of those without IDs at, that they're requiring are women. But this bill is worse than that. Going back down south, Alabama allows state and private university IDs to be used. Alabama. <laughs> no, Alabama. No, 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 no. This bill doesn't even allow people to, if you go to UNC and you're paying all that money, or Duke, or, or Shaw, or North Carolina Central, they say even if you have a state ID from a school, private or public, it's not valid. South Carolina has a provision in its legislation about this. It says you get vote ID, but it says if a hurricane comes through or if a snowstorm comes through and creates inclement weather and, 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 and you can't find it, you know, your house is torn up or something, you can still vote. This bill says no. No. They don't care if white, black, Republican, Democrat, they're making a difference. If you don't have it, a hurricane comes through here, a big storm comes through up here in Mitchell County, a hurricane hits us down there on the coast, you can't find your ID, you just, you're just out. Because they know if all of us get together and start talking, a narrow-minded agenda can't win. And one thing that North Carolina is poll high on, and that is a deep dislike for politicians, Democrat or Republican, <laughs> who use their power to rig elections. Let me tell you what else they passed. And, and Mr. Senator Heiss, I keep calling his name. I got a little report. Where's my report card on him? I got a report card over there. He voted on all this stuff. 
They want to end the pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds who take civics. Now why would you want to do that? If you, if you, don't, if you teach a kid civics and then say, then say you, you can hold up front, and then say uh, now that you've gotten civics, you can pre-register so that you already be registered when you're 18, you pre-register for the draft. But in this state now, it's now illegal. 16-year-old, 17-year-old, can't pre-register. They voted to eliminate same-day registration. And last time, uh, as many Republicans as Democrats used same-day registration. They voted to increase the maximum campaign contribution to $5,000 and it will increase every two years with the consumer price index. I mean, you can put more money behind candidates. What does that mean for folk like us that don't have all that money? They also put a provision in that weakens the disclosure requirement for independent expenditure. In other words, they're opening the door for unlimited expending expenditures on campaigns, and they don't have to tell you who's spending the money. Now, all I have to say about that is I came up here on some crooked roads. <laughs> but they ain't as crooked as that. <laughs> now, that's crooked. That's crooked. They've also passed a bill, the authorization of vigilante poll observers. In other words, for anybody can just walk in the precinct now and start questioning you. I could come up here and question you. They expanded the scope of who may examine the registration record. Now they've opened it up of who can actually go in and pull all the records out. See, they, 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 they said it was about voter ID, but it's about something bigger than voter ID. This is a battle for who we are as a people, who we are as a democracy. They made a provision that makes it more difficult to add satellite polling places for the elderly and people with disabilities. If your, your county said, look, we got some people up here that can't go down all these crooked roads and we're going to put some places here, they're saying, no, it's hard. They put new limits on who can assist a voter adjudicated to be incompetent by the court. They repealed three public financing programs, which means now those candidates for courts have to go out and raise money, which means now you open up the possibility of buying judges. And they repeal the disclosure requirements under candidate-specific communication. In other words, a candidate can go tell somebody to put something out there against another candidate, and they don't have to say this was paid for by Tim Tyson, which opens up, up for, for lies and, and, and more extremism in the electoral process. So my brothers and sisters, I've been a little long, but you know it's kind of hard to rush through this stuff. It, it hurts to talk about it. It's, it's stuff you would never imagine. How many of you have seen, heard this public policy and seen this stuff, and you never imagined you would see this in your lifetime? We got a 92-year-old woman that comes down tomorrow Monday, and she said to me, Reverend Bob, I can't die now. And she's serious. She said, she said I... You know, I've been in a long time, been in 92 years, and you know, I, I know God, heaven is my home, but I can't die now. And she's like, like that man in the Bible, you know, who said to, to them, give me my mountain. Don't take my mountain away from me. I gotta keep fighting. So what do we do? I believe that we have to have a new language, a new way of talking about who we are that brings us together. Bigger than Republican, Democrat, black and white, liberal versus conservative. Yes, we have to deal with some of those issues in those categories, but we need a language that helps us get at the issue of what's immoral versus what's moral, what's extreme versus what's constitutional, what's right versus what's wrong. And I think we need something new. Say new. new. And for that, that's an acronym. The N stands for We've got to be bold enough now, like Jesus, to just name some stuff as immoral. My grandma used to tell me, she's old Pentecostal, she said, boy, you can't cast some demons out till you call them a demon. You got to call it what it is. You got to call a spade a spade. You got to call it wrong. If it's wrong, it's just wrong. 
wrong is just wrong. It's immoral to hurt unemployed people just because you got the power. It's immoral to tax the working, working people just because you can so that you can give a tax cut to the wealthy. It's wrong. It's just wrong. No, no debate. It's just wrong to attack teachers in public education. And it's just wrong to rig elections so that you can maintain power. It's just plain wrong. And we've got to have a language that allows us to name it just like this. Not about whether you're a Democrat, whether I'm a Republican, whether you're an independent. It's something we need to come together on because they are just wrong. And we need to stand up in righteousness, righteous indignation against them. Number two, we have got to expose the myth. And the myth is where the greedy and the wealthy or their paid puppets run platforms that divide us deliberately so they can rob the bank. They keep black folk from talking to white people, and white people from talking to white black people, and they divide us west and east, and they hope the two never meet. Because if we meet, we just might find out we got common ground. <laughs> if we meet, we might find out that the folk in Mitchell County love education just as much as my mom in Martin County. You see, if we meet, we might find out we have some common values and some common faith and some common love. We might be able to agree on some things like loving your neighbor as yourself. We might be able to agree on some fundamental principles of the good of the whole. And so we've got to destroy this myth that people somehow teach that you can hurt some people and it'll only hurt those people over there. This world now is so close and it's brought this so small because of technology, because of who we are, as Dr. King said, we are inextricably bound together. What affects one affects the other. What hurt, hurts folk in Martin County hurts folk in Mitchell County. It doesn't, it, there's a connection that we have in our common humanity. And we have to destroy this myth that you can write a policy and just hurt those people. Who are those people? You can hurt them. Who, are, who, who is that? Who are they? And then last thing, we have to work to build a fusion movement today. And that's what Moral Monday is about. It's a movement about the moral fabric of our society. People who are black and white and Hispanic and young and old coming together to fight against this dangerous agenda of extremism. And thank God, that if there's one thing I'm thankful for, I'm thankful that in this book that I was taught to read, sitting around my grandmama, and I heard my father make, make this book talk time and time again before he left and went home to be with the Lord. I'm glad that no matter what folk do that are wrong, there's, there's this scripture that says, if you hang in there, what people mean for evil, God can turn it to good. Amen. And if there's one thing that I'm glad about in all of this pain, is that when they attacked workers and they attacked teachers and they attacked education and they attacked our children and they attacked the sick folk, it has had a strange way of bringing us together. Yeah, yeah. yeah strange way.